What's everybody? What's everybody? Starting over. What's up, everybody? We are in double digits. This is episode 010 of From the Middle. We are middle class guys living in the middle of America in the middle chapters of our lives with a point of view that's somewhere in the middle. I'm Corey Hubble. Dylan Hubble. Kendall. La, 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 la. <laughs> there were more L's. There were more L's in that just now than are actually in your name. I don't know. I've never well, counted. <laughs> this is part two. This is part two of a conversation that we're having with our special guest, Jeremy Kester. The conversation was going so well in episode nine that we thought it would be a disservice to the, <laughs> to the quality of the conversation to just chop it off there. So we asked Jeremy to come back and continue the conversation. And so if you have not heard episode nine yet, we encourage you do that. It's, it's honestly, it's probably been one of my favorite conversations that we've had um, since we started from the middle. Just, and I, I get it. I'm biased. It's about creative stuff and the art and creative process. So whatever, but it's been good. It's a little mix of everything, comedy, um, serious stuff. Yeah. So it's been good. So Jeremy's back. Thank you so much for having me. Huge <laughs> fan. No joke. Anyway, um, so we're just going to literally pick pick up where we uh, left off and uh, continue the dialogue. So um, we had just told some funny, some funny work stories or interesting work stories about um, being on the road or working with clients. And so Dylan has sort of been treating us like a creative panel and uh, has been facilitate, facilitating the conversation. He doesn't think he's a creative type. I would disagree. Right. I agree with you. Yeah. I disagree with you. He's a self-defecator. <laughs> You got to listen to the previous episode. Yeah, get yeah, that one. yeah. So if you're still listening and haven't listened to nine, seriously pause this yeah. and go back and start nine. Very important. Because be like, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure the word ain't self-defecating. Oh, yeah. no. And I, no. And I am not reading everyone's bios again. Yeah. So let's just jump right in. Uh, Thanks so much and, for uh, me. And we're going to round robin these questions. So you guys feel free to answer what you want. Red Don't answer robin. what you want. Um, not a paid advertisement. And okay. So they have to pay us now. Isn't oh, that how it works? He said round robin. Yeah. Yeah. That makes round more sense. Although robin. you do get unlimited fries, which is a really nice bonus. Is that right? Yeah. Isn't that their steak? I don't care steak? about that. Okay. Well, that's rude. <laughs> Uh, so here's the question. First question. Does your creative side help you connect more or less with other people? Oh, that cuts kind of deep. Hmm. Well, the guys with friends, go ahead and go first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a funny Man, joke because it's know. not true. <laughs> I'd say probably more. It would be my experience for a couple of reasons. One is that the obvious that uh, with music, I can get together with other musicians and and uh, and play through stuff, but um, aside aside from that, uh, so it, and this is something I think that like especially as we've covered before, I'm an introverted guy, and um, and so when I've played music, um, especially again, I'm gonna well, I'm gonna preface this and say this is the the world that's not the worship leading side. Um, like I, I would write some some pretty substantially emotional stuff, and uh, stuff that I would never tell, like a group of people that I know on the level of the people who are in front of me at a bar. Yeah, that I barely know. Um, but I'll sing that same stuff to them, right? Mm. And uh, and then and then you you talk about it, and I mean that that sort of. And many times has caused people to to like start conversations with me about those things because because it uh, they had a, an experience that was similar or something like along those lines and like that was and if, so for an introverted guy I would say that like the music has been an avenue by which I was able to connect to people when I otherwise definitely would not have on my, on my own, just talking to them. So, man, that's so interesting to me. I, if I can ask a question of that, like, what do you think it is about specifically about music that does that? Because, it, you know, in my art forms and what I've created kind of assembly and design and photography, there's really, I haven't found that. So 
what do you think it is about music that you can literally walk up on stage and say, hey, this is an extremely personal and difficult thing I'm going to sing to you and still sing it? What is it about the music that, that allows you to do that? Does it detach? Because it feels more well, emotionally connecting. Yeah. Than less. Well, I mean, I, I think you can't overlook the fact that there's words involved, right? Yeah. So, like, I'm saying things. But if you just said it without but, the music, it would be incredibly uncomfortable. Well, so but what I, is it about I think the music that's doing that? There's, well, there's a, a performance aspect to it. Um, where, uh, I don't know how to explain it. You can kind of just, like, switch. You flip a switch <laughs> internally. And say, I, I'm okay to do anything I want to do now because so I'm on stage in front of these people instead of sort of like among them. Um, so it's a deta- It's like a, your, your, your musical performance person is, is relaying the message for you almost. Yeah. And something that we've, touched on, that we've touched on before uh, is that when you have a bunch of people in a bar, um, then when you're, when you're in front of those people and you're facing all of them at the same time, then what, what's different about that moment is, is each individual connection that I have with each individual person in that room has been diluted. Like Mm. it's not, it's not as intimate as a connection as it is right now. You and I are talking. Um, so this is a more uncomfortable situation for me than it would be if you were in a crowd of, 200 people and I was in front of you and it's not as pouring acute. my heart out. It's yeah. It's not as acute. It's a, yeah. That's yeah. really, that's helpful, man. That's cool. So Beyonce turns into Sasha Fierce. Oh. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. I turn into Ludacris. <laughs> now friend was of, that two names? Friend Luda, of the, Chris. Ludacris. Yeah. Ludacris. Who's a friend of the friend show. Friend of the show. Yeah. Ludacris. Yeah. That's interesting. What was your question? <laughs> yeah. So the question phrase does your creative side help you connect more or less with other people? So if I'm sitting next to somebody on a plane and I don't want to talk to them anymore, when they ask what I do, or if I'm traveling for work, I just say consult creative cons- or I just say business consultant. Right. <laughs> if I'm, if I feel like I want to talk to them more, I say artist and designer or illustrator, and then they always have follow-up questions. Right. Yeah. So something about being a creative to the masses is interesting. So they, they typically want to know more. Then you can very quickly d- go down. You can geek out in your creativity and lose them very quickly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But then it regains itself, especially with the advent of the Internet, where now you can find these communities of people like you who are super into a certain niche uh, graphic novel that only came out at a certain period, like uh, on a smaller scale, like going to a Star Wars convention. You get there and you're like, I found my people. Mm. Now, some of them are like hardcore deep dive they've made this their lives they bleed star wars where you're just like it's a good movie saga that i happen to enjoy right yeah so there are again like everything there are levels but so so i would say to answer your question it's probably gets uh, is there are more connections because i'm an artist and a creative and then at some point i lose people (laughs) but even when that happens it's okay because there's a whole group somewhere in the world that wants to just talk about only that Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I have found it to be uh, superficially very easy to connect with people. So uh, as a creative, in a sense, like conceptually, your, your job is to be interesting. So that's what creativity is. And to some degree, you, you're trying to draw interest and buy into what you're doing. So I think the difficulty for me is I'm a, I'm a very functional introvert. Um, I, I crash really hard after great social settings, and I love great social settings. But what ends up happening is um, I'm able to create a presentable product that is Jeremy in a creative way that people consume well. But it's very, very difficult to 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 really, really connect. And I, I think, Dylan, that's something that's been uniquely special about our friendship as quickly as it's happened. Harley and I, I can sense that with you guys very quickly, is that like... That you can kind of let the guard down. This is an odd format because I'm doing that intimately with you guys uh, and just kind of forgetting that this is going to be uh, everywhere and permanent. So, uh, but, but I, I, I think for superficially, creatively, I'm almost in a sense like your stage performance you're talking about in my space of consulting and communication and art is like 
my, my personhood. So I'm able to walk mm. into a room and be connectable very, very quickly, which is something people see as a positive. But I have a lot of great difficulty differentiating sometimes between that performance and myself and, and, and godly character. And, and so there, there, it's a, I think for me, I would say that a creative life is a bit of a lonely life for me because I haven't cracked it yet. Mm. But, uh, yeah, I'm not lonely, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it, it's uh, wow. You sit on the couch and, and it really goes deep uh, here. But I, yeah, but I'm just saying there's a, there's a very, very real and very strong current of difficulty built into being easily connected uh, right away. So yeah. Yeah. That's where I'm at. All right. So uh, Let's shift gears a little bit. So when you're actually uh, sort of ramping up the creative process for some kind of project or gig or whatever, what is the pro- what does your process look like when you're actually in front of the client or the person you're working with? So not the behind the scenes. What does that process look like when you actually have the other person in front of you um, and, and you're st- ramping up the project? Kind of the onboarding of the project sure, a little bit? Yeah. Is How, that a fair word? Think about it in any way that benefits you. Answer it however you want. But just sort of that, not the behind the scenes. Don't go there yet. When you're actually facing that sort of initial phase of a project. It's very, very exploratory in a very, very confined way for me. And so what I'm doing is I'm very clearly establishing the borders and parameters of how I operate and then letting the client roam freely within those parameters, even though the parameters can be a bit restrictive in my case. I do a very specific thing for a very specific group of people, but I'll say, use your imagination and, and how are we approach this problem and what are we going to do? And I, I just try to paint a picture for them of, of what the process, it's almost like, uh, it's almost like a tour, like, oh, you're going to walk in. I can imagine doing that. Uh, you did this with DreamWorks, right? You said to us and you kind of painted a picture and I can see it. Uh-huh. That's my job with the client is to paint a picture of how it's going to operate because yeah. if we go outside of what I'm, my gifts are, I'm, I'm terrible. So, uh, so that's what I'm doing creatively without the contract. The contract comes later sure. and the contract lines up with that. But I'm like, isn't it so cool that we're going to be able to do this and we're not going to do this cause we don't have to, we're going to do this, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the idea. Uh, I would agree. I think it's almost like, again, we talked about it in the last episode. It's a little bit like you said parameters or I would call it expectations. Yeah. We're just sort of feeling each other out, which I'm, I'm, probably rare in the fact that I would consider myself an extrovert. I'm a Enneagram seven. So if you've read any, any is about that Scientology, that, what is that? Yeah, it's pretty much Scientology. Um, <laughs> personality profiling. So there's one that gives you an animal. I'm an otter. There's one that gives you a number. I'm a seven. There's one that, like just the, the outgoing, like, uh, the otter. Yeah, I'm, I'm a seven otter. Um, somebody out there is tracking with me. Uh, I'm in the rungs. I'm an extrovert. So I, I get energy from people. So me being in this setting with you guys or in a very large group or even one on one, I'm highly relational. I enjoy getting to know you. So part of the process I've designed for myself with my freelance business is I just want to hang out with you and get to know you and talk to you about what you think this is. I'm scoping. I'm getting a gauge for is this a good fit or not? And one of the things I do with logos, for example, and not to show too many of my cards, it's not like intellectual property that I've you know got, but it's like, give me some adjectives to describe what you want your business to be. So if they say things like, we're very traditional, this is a three generation company, we take our job very seriously, that logo looks very different than somebody who says, we're just fun and we want to engage and we're really trendy and... Those are two very different logos. That's it could be the same type of a business, but <clears throat> me asking a question, and I've had clients go, why do you want me to give you adjectives to describe? It's a weird exercise for them, but mm-hmm. the way they respond to that, I'm already sketching in my brain at Starbucks. Right. Sounds like what he was talking about with music theory, yeah. like where you're, you've got, you got the yeah. puzzle pieces. That's really neat. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing like a mini little research project, not just on the project, but on you as a person and how we're going to work together. So I'm also sizing you up a little bit and going, okay, I can't joke with you. You don't like that. That's fun. like you, you want to treat this like a very serious thing. So the best way to do that in my mind is a sit down. So, so to me, um, 
that's one of the most fun parts of what I get to do is the project is always different. It's not always logos. It's not always a mural. It's not always caricatures. It's not, it's always something different. The people are always different and the ask is always different. So that's what I'm just trying to figure out in scope. It's like putting little feelers out there and trying to just size it all up. Indeed. Um, yeah, that's awesome. We, we do that similar on the communication side a little bit where people, you know, if you think of describing a first date when you're, your mom's trying to hit, set you up with a first date, and she says she's nice, she's pretty. Those are kind of minimum descriptors. It, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> right. lead you anywhere. Right. Whereas, you know, describe your wife. My wife, 14 years, is incredibly resilient and beautiful and getting better every day and is resourceful mm-hmm. and creative. And, like, you know, it's fun to try to dra- describe your business in a more expressive and loving right. way. That's neat, man. It sounds like, so, like, I mean, I... This question like doesn't really apply much to me, but what I'm kind of seeing in your answers is that sort of those initial steps are like I, I've heard both of you mention the word parameters, um, which is something that that for me and uh, especially in, in in writing processes. So like a creative writing, I I, I took creative writing courses in in college, and. And one thing that that is clear that I didn't, I never really thought about until then, um, is that like one of the one of the ways that creativity shines, an opportunity for creativity, is actually when you force yourself to be in a box. So, because we often think of like the creative people as the outside of box thinkers, but possibly a, a closer reality is that there are they are just better at thinking. In, in a box. Box builders almost. Mm. Right. Yeah. So it's like, a great so, way to put it. so you can have like, you can put words on a page that say something that, that you want to say, but then to turn that into like a particular type of poetry, you have to say, okay, take that exact same phrase that you have. Now make it fit mm-hmm. eight syllables. Yeah. Figure that out. Yeah. Um, that, that kind That's of thing. That's a high chew. Yeah. So, <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> um, but fig- figuring all of that out, uh, and and so and so with creative writing, sort of the practices that we would do is we would come up with those boxes that we have to yeah. we have to write about this thing or that thing or about whatever experience. Here's your parameters. Use your creativity to stay within those parameters. Um, force yourself to think of things differently. And so that's what I'm kind of hearing is is uh, sort of like those first steps are like, okay, we need to build the box in which I can operate and yeah, and express great. and practice uh, my, my creative skills and, and gifts. Um, I need to know the, in order for me to do that, I need to know the parameters that I have. I think that's a really fair description. I mean, I think that's great is, is in sense the parameter building is a really huge part of of the process. Yeah. In a beautiful, like caring way, not in a yeah. restrictive way. That's the difficulty. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause for me, the next step is I'm going to go sketch <clears throat> based right. on whatever we just talked about at the coffee shop over the next week. I'm going to sketch whatever we just talked about. Limitless is great until I'm going to have to start sketching. Yeah. Cause now limitless means 400 sketches. Sure. So what I'm trying to figure out in our initial meeting is what crayons do you want me to use? Is this too outside of the box for you? Okay, you're a little more rigid in that. Or, or no, you're okay with me taking some artistic license and doing something real trendy or creative, right? So so what I'm trying to do is figure out some of those things. We're, it's still limitless when we sit down, but you've given me more than you realize for what tools I'm going to use. And, and, and um, we're starting to carve out a little bit of a route so that now when I'm doing sketches, I only have to do 12 instead yeah. of 400. Yeah, it's, that's a misnomer, I think, in the creative world. In, in my case, communication, your sketching and, and music is that it's more of a building like you're, you have nothing and then, you're, and then you're sculpting some sort of project. But really, it's more archaeological. It, really, the project is usually in there somewhere. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're very carefully digging away the stuff. You know that that's not even close, so you're just going to use a big shovel and you're just going to throw that yeah. out. But mm-hmm. you start to get close to it and, and we're literally in the dictionary at cases. In your case, you're literally looking at that swoop on the corner to kind of say, like, what? how do I get to the edge of this without damaging it? And yeah. it's, it's much more archaeological than it is build from scratch in my yeah. case. I don't know if that's no, a fair I, description it, for... It, no, it's it's well said. It, it is. It's it's Again, it's... <clears throat> 
research project, archaeology, trying to figure out what's included, what's in, what's in the box, what's not in the box, what are you cool with, what are your personal, that, that's too far outside of the bounds for you. But, but yeah, I think that's right. Mm. It reminds me a little of that commercial where somebody wants to buy a car and they're like, I want a van. I want a van with this. Do oh, they swoop yeah. really oh, fast? Yeah, yeah. And you see the cars keep like all there's limitless cars. And every time they say what they want, a bunch go away. Yep. So it's like, I want a van. I want a van with this feature. I want a new van. I want it newer than 2004. Exactly. I want it to be blue. I want it to have this. And at the very end, there's one van left. Right. Uh, and so it's that's. That analogy has been used before in sales. It's the same with like needs assessment and finding the right solution for somebody. Yep. Uh, But it's the same type of thing. Like that's what my brain went to. It's every little question and everything that you learn just narrows it down a little bit more. See, he says he's not creative. Which which actually segues nicely. I think, Kendall, you started answering my next question. So what is the process? uh, What does your process look like once you've started and the initial meeting is over? Uh, and I think you were starting to allude to that a little bit with some of your practicing and Corey, the same thing. I think you're sketching. And so if you want to add any more details there, feel free. And then I'll, I'll move on past that. We're in the process now. Yeah. You're in the process. No longer sitting with, with another person in front of you yeah. telling what they want. The client meeting's over. Yeah. You start sketching. Go. So the minute I, I mean, even when I'm driving home, I'm already drawing in my brain. And I don't know if that makes sense if you're not like a visual person, but I'm, I'm literally making choices in my head as though I'm working in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. And I'm moving. If your logo has an ampersand in it, for example, it's, it's a law firm with an ampersand of the two names. I'm moving it in my brain. I'm moving it two clicks to the left, two clicks to the right. What if I overlap the ampersand around one of the letters? I'm doing that in my brain. <laughs> yeah, it all starts with a line, right? It's it's. It's very simple shapes, yeah. But the arrangement of that is just yeah. unbelievably difficult, and I can't imagine doing that. Yeah, it's so, I'm, so I'm doing that on, in my brain. So by the time I get home, or within the coming days, I've already got what I think are half a dozen to a dozen strong candidates for what could be your your logo or the cornerstone of your brand. Then, when it gets to the time to execute, most of the thought has already been done. You've already been sketching in your, when I'm having, when I'm playing with my kids in the backyard, I'm still going, well, what if I move the letter? What if the letter overlapped in this way? And we did a drop shadow so that it like, I'm doing that like, (laughs) right. Yeah. When I'm eating dinner or with my kids or like, I'm making all those mental choices. And so by the time I'm actually at a computer or an iPad, it's pretty quick. The execution time then is pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, you don't charge for time sketched. <laughs> I mean, that's a really important... Like, I don't charge for the time it takes me to click the shutter or or communicate the message. Yeah. Like, you, you you know, you charge for the value of the product. Yeah. So, yeah. Kendall, sorry. Did you have something to say on that? No. Oh. There's a yeah. great story um, somebody told me once that um, it was a manager at a Kmart. In the Kmart, I think one of the bike brands that they carried was Huffy. So just work with the story, because I don't know if that's accurate. But the Huffy... Uh, uh, representative or dealer came into the Kmart to, to just check the inventory and, and what types of bikes are selling and whatever. Um, the day that he happened to be there, a mom brought in her child's bike um, and wanted Kmart to fix it. And Kmart says, well, we don't really do that. But the Huffy guy happens, the Huffy rep is actually here today. Hmm. And so the Kmart manager and him go back to the, they say, bring the bike to the back of the, the, the loading dock and we'll take a look at it. So the, the Huffy guy sort of looks at the, the bike. He, the mom and the kid are out in the store now doing the rest of their shopping. And so it's just the manager and the bike guy. And he looks at it and he's assessing it and he's like looking at it from all different angles. He's not even really touching it. But at some point he just takes a rubber mallet and just whacks one part of the bike and it's fixed. So they take it back out to the lady and he goes, that'll be, let's call it $50. And the Kmart manager goes, how in good conscience can you charge that woman $50? You just whacked it with a hammer. It took you all of a millisecond to fix the kid's bike. And he goes, because I've been studying bikes for the last 10 years, because I've been seeing what, how they get damaged and what needs fixed and and that was such a great story to illustrate. Yeah, like, that's great. Like, how long would it physically take you to produce on in Adobe Illustrator the Nike swoosh? Right. That would probably take you three and a half minutes if you 
don't know how to use Adobe Illustrator. That's such a difficult part of our process. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So how do I charge for four years of art school, for countless clients, for learning the wrong way Kids, a bunch man. of different times? Kids. For, <laughs> yeah. Insurance, yeah. How do I, how do I, what's a fair price? And many people that approach me just don't know. They're not trying to... Um, undercut me and they're not trying to insult me. They just don't know what stuff costs. And most of them work hourly. And that's not mm -hmm. a dig at all. I mean, that's I've spent yeah. a lot of time mm -hmm. working hourly, but in their mind, the way that value is quantitative yep. is, is through time. Yep. Uh, and and that's just not how this business works, friends. It, it just isn't. The, it, the, the thought equity is a real thing. That's I've I heard that term a long time ago and I was like, that really resonates. I That's get a good term. I get what that means now. You're thought not putting equity. sweat equity into it. You're putting tons and tons and tons. And and I'm looking at other logos while I'm working on your project, going, Why is that one successful? Why yeah. does that one work? Yeah, if you why look does, at it, why does that one not work? If you look at a giant machine that's maybe pressing something, yeah, and it's a million dollar machine. The, the pressing of the thing is just yeah. one mechanism. You go, yep. what, what on earth? That's super simple. Yeah, that's a huge yep. struggle. Um, my creative process, if I, if I were to talk about the photography, it's really to, to observe and then properly document. But in the, in the clarity work that I do, I, I consult with groups and companies on how they, how they uh, even, even worse than what, what you're talking about, about the swoop. I'm literally just thinking and explaining things for a living uh, on the side. But I'm, what I'm doing is I'm helping them communicate in a way that's clear. So for example, I guess my process would be everyone explains themselves as fun, professional, and creative. Those are the three things that we all say we do. Um, when you claim something about yourself, essentially what you're saying is the reason I brought this up is because other people aren't this. I mean, that's what you're saying, right? So, so if you say he's the tall guy, you would never describe somebody as the tall guy if everybody in the room was seven foot. You're only implying that he's tall and other people aren't tall. So if you're listening and you're going into a job interview, this is really important because if you claim to be fun, professional, creative, in other words, people like me, some variation of that, people like me, I show up on time, I do a good job, and I do it in a unique way, those are the minimum requirements to be employed, <laughs> right? If you're competing against people who don't show up are not fun to be around <laughs> and do things in stupid ways, right? So when you claim that about yourself, you're, you're implying that other people aren't. And this is how multi-million dollar companies express, you know, we have the best car, Okay, well, you have to convince me, right? And so, for example, the Guided Hunts company that I worked with, um, they're just incredible human beings. Every hunt described themselves at every guided hunt. In other words, they take you out and they take you hunting and the land is curated and it's this beautiful experience. Every place said, um, get a big buck, you know, like you go out and you, you kill a buck. I'm in. And that's what, they were, that's what they were selling. Well, that's not always true. Not everybody gets a big buck when they right. go out. And so when we worked for two, three days and just grounded out on the verbiage, and we came to a place where we said the essence of their business is guided hunts among friends. That was the whole idea. She cooked for them in the morning, home cooked meals. There was a fireplace. They carved their names in the, the kitchen table when you went there. Beautiful yeah. home. It's a lodge. It's not about the hunt. It's about the, the friends mm -hmm. and the stories. And their business quadrupled. <clears throat> they, they were booked out three years. They were able to raise their rates. They got a TV show from Cabela's. And there's just all these crazy things that happen when you communicate yourself clearly. So for example, um, I'm getting pumped about this. I'm hoping I'm not taking too much time. It's just one of my favorite topics. No, I'm, I'm totally tracking. So, so how I describe what I do in the clarity space is I help you say what we've been meaning to say the whole time. Well, there is an opposite of that. That's good. We help you say what you're supposed to say to be successful, right? Those are most marketing firms. That's okay. That's a good thing. Yeah. And then clients can come to me or they can come to them and it's okay. I don't say I help you communicate well, because that's only going to beat companies that say, I help you communicate poorly, right? So, right. so that's, what we, that's what we kind of do. And in the photography space, when I was working with photographers, it was the same thing. They described themselves as good photographers. And it's like, well, you're going you're gonna to crush the bad photographers. Um, but, but who else? And so there was a photographer that I knew, uh, many that were in the journalism side. And their focus was on telling the story accurately, not, not interjecting. It's not fair. You're in a war zone and you're trying to tell the world how horrible this war is. You don't pose it. That's a lie, right? You, you try to not be in it at all. So we have photographers that say, I'm a journalist. And then you also have photographers on the other side that say, I help you look like what you see inside of yourself. So maybe somebody's sick or they're, they're struggling like your drawing that you did. Mm -hmm. And they take these beautiful photoshopped, incredible photos with wings and with these beautiful things. Well, both of those are okay and they're opposites, but they're describing themselves in a, in a clear way. So I, that's something that I really, I just, I don't know. I just feel like that sort of communication in my life, that's an area that I'm proud of 
trying to be thoughtful about yeah. compliments and about how I describe things because uh, one of my favorite things in the world, and it's happened a few times here, is uh, not, not horn tooting. I just, I'm just, it's exciting to me. It's when people say, that's a great way to say it. That makes sense to me or, mm-hmm. you know, they get caught up in it. So that's, that's my process and it's really fun. At the end, it's like, yeah, that's the, the hilarity of what you said is like how easy things are at the end. This is so true with me because what happens is I'm literally telling them I'm going to help you say what you were trying to say the whole time. So when I'm at my best in that process, mm-hmm. the client literally says at the end, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean, my best payoff is that they discredit my work right at the end. And I always give it to them after the check because, you know, they're, they're this beautiful, wonderful process and it's incredible and it's exploring and it's, it's very revealing. And then at the end they go, so I got a sentence out of this. Is that right? <laughs> you know, but, but that, it's, it's been changing. It's changed their income. It's changed their, their life. So it's and good. it's, and it's huge because you've helped, you've helped them synthesize all of that into one cohesive story that they can own and then take forward. Um, in my day job as a graphic facilitator, picture a room with the, all of the, the walls are whiteboards. There's a circle of chairs, no tables, no laptops, no phones. And the executives are just talking. That's all they're doing for eight hours. They're just talking. I'm just synthesizing what they're saying, taking out the, the separating the wheat from the chaff, the comments that are like, eh, that's a nothing burger. Or the comments are like, Ooh, that was really good. So I just regurgitate it onto the wall at the end of which they'll almost always go, wow, you understand our world and what we do with offshore drilling or with what so well. And you're like, no, I just regurgitated what you said. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but it's amazing because they're so in it. They're so in the woods that sometimes they can't see the path in or out or what makes the most sense. And I'm just organizing it onto a wall, giving it some visual hierarchy and helping the story make sense. But then at the end they go, Oh, I'm reading a book right now. That's changing. Are you familiar with building a story? Oh boy. Yeah. Donald Miller. I am. Yeah. So, um, brilliant. This is changing. This is changing so much about what I do both in my day job and with my freelance career. So the book is called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller, um, clarifying your message so that customers will listen. In this book, he talks about something that is so true. So if you're, uh, if you know anything about Joseph Campbell or um, anybody that started sort of mythology, Joseph Campbell had a book, I think, called 37 Plots, which basically says that from the dawn of time, all stories basically boiled down into some basic core plots. He wrote all of this in a book. Ruined it for all of us. Ruined it for all of us. Yeah, what a jerk. Um, But he basically boiled all of human storytelling down (laughs) into some core plots, of which George Lucas based Star Wars, because Lucas was studying... Joseph Campbell in college. Wow. And so the archetypes, the hero archetypes of, of Luke and Obi-Wan and all of that is Joseph Campbell research baked down into a space saga, which is one of the reasons why I love Star Wars so much. So using that as a guide, I'll just give you some of the, um, the nutshell of what StoryBrand talks about. So if you think of almost all marketing, any business doing any marketing, almost always they're talking about themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. We have this many locations. We have this much expertise. Our product is the best at this. We have this many uh, employees all over the world helping you do. They're talking about themselves as the hero. Right. So the framework of StoryBrand says you have a character who has a problem and meets a guide who gives them a plan, calls them to action that ends in success or that helps them avoid failure. So if we put the lens of Star Wars on that, Luke has a problem. He must defeat the Empire, who meets a guide, Obi-Wan, who gives him something he needs, gives him a plan, gives him the force to call them to action. He has to go defeat the Empire. If he does this successfully, and it ends in success. He defeats uh, the rebellion, avoids defeat. And if he does it unsuccessfully... um, we know what happens, but it helps him avoid fail- failure, which would be the rebellion is crushed. So here's, here's the whole twist of the book. Every company should be talking about themselves as Obi-Wan, not Luke. Mm-hmm. Yep. So and, good. And companies that apply that to their marketing, like you said about the, the guided hunts, triple the business almost overnight. 
Because you, the consumer, are the hero of your story. <laughs> you are the center of Brilliant. your universe. Yep. You don't... I, if, if I'm a hero, we're now competing heroes. I don't mm -hmm. want to buy from a hero. You don't right? want to like, buy from a hero. Yeah. You're Luke Skywalker. I am not Luke Skywalker. That's great. So if we, the company, product, service, creative, whatever, am empowering you to get what you want then that you are much more interested in. And this isn't a way to exploit people's desires. No. This, this is just the reality of life as we know it. So when I read StoryBrand, and I'm only a, a handful of chapters oh, in. Oh, you're going to love it, man. But I'm like, oh my gosh, that changes everything. So the way that I talk to customers now is totally different because I'm, and I wouldn't, I, I would say I was leaning a little bit this way anyway, but this just put words to what I've been thinking for a long time, which is you don't care what clients I've worked with. Right. You don't care the, at some point you do, cause you want to see that I at least kind of know what I'm talking about. They only want to know because they want to be that. They want to be that. They want to be the <laughs> right. hero. So yeah, you're hiring great. Obi Wan. You're not hiring another Luke. And mm -hmm. that was like, that's so good. I love, I love where this is going. So um, if you have anything to do with telling stories, business, sales, marketing, you have to pick up building a story brand. It's I'll so, you, so good. If I can add a couple of business books, yes, would that be all right? Yes, uh, Behavioral Economics okay. uh, book is called uh, Predictably Irrational. That's a life changer there. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one called Lean Startup. And I think yep. story brand, predictably irrational, lean startup. If you kind of mold those, if you're thinking about yeah. starting a creative business, that's yeah. a really good place an to An amalgam, start. might you it's say? It's an amalgam. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. If I describe myself as I help you say what you have been trying to say the whole time, then then I'm then I'm Obi-Wan. It would be very easy, and I, I could have fallen into this by accident uh, and said, um, I am the brilliant one who will bring you know some yeah. sort of message to light. And right. that's wrong. That's the wrong way. It is. It's a really great way to put it. Anyway, so that's that's blowing my mind right now. So... Dude, so good. Awesome. So, uh, <laughs> next question. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I, well, that's Transition what, that's button. Why I, that's why I'm interviewing and why I'm not answering <laughs> questions because I have nothing to Stop. add to this type of stuff. Dylan, I'm Stop not interested it. in Look, that. You're brilliant. I, I think you're. I think you're as Obi Wan as everyone in the room. I'm going to be honest with you. You've helped me navigate some really difficult situations socially and in other ways and in business. And you have been an incredible That's so true, guide and, and, and friend. And I, I would say if I'm selfish enough to believe I'm I'm whatever that guy's name is. I got to see the movie. But uh, the main guy, what's his name? Luke. Luke. Um, Skywalker. Yeah. Yep. Right. That's it. That's uh, if one. I was him, yeah. I would say you're quite a bit more Obi-Wan than I am Dil uh, Dylan. <clears throat> From the Starship uh, Enterprise. Yeah. Oh, that's, God. That's very kind. Instantly angry. Yeah. That's very kind. No, and I'm not <laughs> saying that I'm not good at anything. This is, yeah. I'm a communication guy, bud, and I meant what I said. Oh, that's so very, that's you're Obi-Wan. <laughs> that's very sweet. <laughs> I'm your boss right now in that specific area, and you are awesome. <laughs> that's sweet. Thank you. So, yeah. uh, uh, moving on, uh, what quirky <laughs> or weird habits do you have when you're working, and which of those help you stay uh, focused or inspired while you're working? <laughs> what? Uh, quirky or weird? Yeah, so there's there's one thing. I've created a few businesses and, and worked with others, and I have a protected playlist called To Write to Inspire, and Ooh. I literally only listen to that playlist um, when I, I need to create something important. And so... Um, I, I really do protect it. I never let it play uh, before. It's not a superstition, but I just have a rhythm that I've built uh, with that. And I have an expectation that, okay, I've done this before. I've known nothing and created something while this is playing. And so that, that playlist, weirdly, we did that with uh, the birth of our child. I created a playlist that my wife listened to at really, really calm moments. Mm. And, and we pulled that in when she was uh, in labor and that was uh, helpful. But yeah, I have this to write, to inspire. And um, I don't share it with anybody for fear that someone else is going to be like listening to it when I'm around. So that's weird and dumb. I would say mm -hmm. is that you said weird and dumb stuff that you do weird or quirky. And what of those things inspire you? So that's great. If that's, if that's what helps you work, then that's what I'm it asking. zones me in pretty quick. I mean, it's, it's something that locks me in pretty quickly. It's a weird ritual, but it helps. I thought you were going like, I stick my tongue out when I draw. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's fine. It's as open ended as you want. Like all the men in our, in, on the Hubble side of the family stick their tongue out when they're like really intently focusing on something. I can't express how much I love that. 
I think that's amazing. And like to the point that like my four year old son is doing it now. Like yes, he'll 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 the skin on his mouth will be raw, and his (laughs) teachers are like, every time he's zeroed in on something, his tongue's out of his head, and it's just like a weird thing. Yeah, humble lips. The the guys in our family do are just sticking our tongue out, like you're tying a a hook on a fishing line or whatever. Like my tongue's out. Typically, it's like if there's a curve that I'm trying to perfect, which now the new uh, the new Procreate on the iPad has just a thing that makes the curves easy, so you don't have to. You don't have to stick your tongue out anymore. So um, <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> you just stick your tongue out. It's just like a Michael Jordan thing. Michael I'm Jordan's like, <laughs> dunking a basketball. I'm drawing curves. It's very hard work. Um, oh gosh. When I am in the when I am in the zone though, and, and my wife will, will attest to this. Oh. When I am in the zone, and you can probably relate, you guys. But like, if something interrupts that. I'm not fun to be around because oh, I'm yeah. I'm so oh, yeah I it's like clear the mechanism the baseball movie uh, uh, which movie was that oh. uh, Field of Dreams that'll be your fun facts next week Rookie of the Year Rookie yeah clear the mechanism where it's just like a tunnel between him, between him and the catcher that's what the creative process is like for me. in the outfield. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. League of their own. So, <laughs> Are we still guessing? I know. Uh, I know. Gary Comerford is 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 Sam so Lott. mad somewhere because I can't remember the name of the baseball movie. Anyway, um, let us know on social media. Cousin Vinny. But if I'm in the, <laughs> you guys are jerks. That, that I, one with Charlie Sheen. Um, if I'm in that space, it's and something breaks it. I'm not. I'm not fun to be around. So I'm sorry if you've ever walked in and I'm just like super focused. I've got an idea that I'm trying to flesh out and. So yeah, that's a uh, probably a quarter. My unlock, my unlock is at the end. I'd be interested to hear Kendall what you what your process is like with music. Mine is at the end. I have no satisfaction or tunnel all the way through. One hundred percent on the communication side. I feel like I have no idea what I'm going to do next. I'm completely, hmm. completely lost. And then it clicks. Oh, okay. And then I've got it, and I can't lose it. And it's it's done. It's permanent. But man, oh man, like I I, I appreciate that your art allows you to see progress physically. That sounds awesome. Uh, <laughs> what's, that, what's that like? <laughs> yeah, mine is just like basically uh, borderline mental illness, and then relief at the end. Sure. That's kind of what it is. But I get paid for that, so it's good. Uh, but I'd be interested to see in music. What does that look like? So the, what, what was the, what, what am I <laughs> so answering again? Quir- bunch quir- of quirky, quirky and weird habits or yeah. inspiration. And which of those things help you oh, stay the joke, most right. focused or inspired? Yeah, that's a better question. Oh, than wow. I was asking. Okay. Um, I, I don't know of anything necessarily active that I, that I'm doing sort of during the moments that's other than, uh, so here's, uh, so like it, Salting your lips. Salting my lips. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of them. No, so 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 what I'm thinking of, what's in my mind right now is is songwriting. Um, so I was sitting down trying to trying to write trying to write a song, put a song together, and uh, I I have to have sort of I have to have silence. I have to be alone, and um. And I, I I never really realized that because I like I lived by myself for a while, uh, or it, if I had roommates, like there were plenty of times when I was alone. So it didn't feel like something you had to create. It just was right. always it was that just way. There. Yeah. And then and then uh, like I get married and and like even though she's my wife, like it's still like careful. <laughs> even though she's my wife, it's still a situation. Even even with the kids, it's this way. Like, I can't. I'm not. I'm not going to do it when I know that there's other people who are within earshot. Yeah. Like I just can't. Um, and so like I I just I wait for those moments when I'm entirely by myself, and I know that like I can sing and and belt and and uh, and play and and have nobody hear it. And I, I don't know exactly why that is that I, I can't like let someone in on that process. Yeah. But it's gotta be me by myself. No one can hear me. It's not ready yet. You know? Yeah. Kind of. But then like at the same time, but I'll take like chunks of say, I'll take chunks of a song and, and, and play them for my wife and, and ask her, her opinion. But then when I go back to like, like the trial and error portions and that kind of thing, again, it's gotta be just me. And, no one can be in the house. So answer your question, uh, one of us sticks our tongue out. <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. That's the answer to that question. Actually And I'm, we're not gonna answer that I'm question. I'm told Just, that I have that I that I sometimes have a have like a default face. 
Is that right? Yeah. But resting I could, I worship face? But I, I no, not <laughs> resting resting worship face. RWF. <laughs> no, but I have a, a, a like a, a like a tongue in my cheek kind of thing that I that I do. Um that I would not be able to recreate for you now because I don't yeah. know exactly. Yeah, and you'd what have to be is. alone. That's <laughs> actually an awesome segue to my next question. So what are the things that take you out of your creative process? Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah huge time waste no 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 big time suckers <laughs> yeah uh my, my own brain this is a short answer for me um restlessness mental restlessness just is the main thing is i have to almost clean the room i almost have to sit down and i haven't i haven't figured this out yet uh this is a this is a character flaw right now but but i'm working on it is just really taking ownership of every thought and putting it where it's supposed to be speaking truth to those thoughts in a way that that will rest, put me at rest, take the anxiety. Cause I think that's, that's my biggest, uh, default hurt on my creative processes is my own willingness to, when it gets hard, shoot to another project. And that's just, that's mm. just really hard. Cause I've always got 10 or 15 and, and 12 made up projects. So I think that restless mental restlessness is definitely the biggest enemy of, of staying in the zone. Like you asked. Mm. Same. I would say, say it differently slightly in that it I've got a, I've got to clean the room mentally. Like I can't, it, it, we're all married. None of us argue with our wives ever. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But if Sherry and I are having a tiff, like I cannot, I cannot try to get into a creative zone because mentally I want that to be at peace and resolved. Mm. Yeah. Um, I want my desk to be clean. I want, if the yard needs mowed and I know it needs mowed and it's raining and so I can't mow, but this is the one good day to mow. I got to mow. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, wise. I got to sort of just like clean the mental slate so that I can zero in with, with no guilt or with no like mm. I'm drawing something out or just to know that I can focus specifically on this thing. Otherwise, it's um, my brain is too, is going too many places. Like you said, it's restless mind. With songwriting, something that I fall into is there's just there's so much material out there mm-hmm. already and and even if if it's not like inevitably at some point it enters my mind like have i subconsciously stolen someone else's song here is that why because you've often said that you don't listen to a lot of what's being played or what's in the top that's 10 so list. hard man that's an art thing for sure um well that, that's not necessarily why uh, I get, well, I guess that's part of it, but, um, but no, so that's, that's always on my mind. And, and once, and once that like enters my mind of like, does this sound like something that you weren't, you weren't even thinking about because that has happened to me before and that like, I'd, I will write something and, and say like the, the bridge or, or whatever, um, would, uh, like well after the fact it will pop in my brain. That is the exact same yeah. melodic line as this other song. I can help and, you there. I hate all bridges. Just yeah. so you know, just take them all out. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and and uh, and I didn't even I didn't even realize it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so now, like, I'm afraid of that happening every time. Mm. Mm. That was a tragic and wonderful realization when I realized that literally I've never created anything. Everything I've ever done is assembly. Yeah. It's some form of taking all the stuff that I've learned and arranging it in a way that the people in front of me have never seen before. You know, I mean, it's, it's a very, it was a very kind of soul crushing moment at first. Like I, I really can't create anything. And then it, eventually it was pretty freeing where I said, no, I'm an assembly guy. I'm an arranger. I'm a, I'm a, you yeah. know what I mean? It's okay. It's fine. I think you're probably in a similar. Well, no, I think that's a good point. I think that's, I think that's probably very helpful. Uh, it, it, if I were to, to have that approach because it's like, I mean, it, the, there's not an infinite number of, of songs out there. Yeah, but, they're arrangements. That's what you're but doing. But yeah, but I mean, they're all. I mean, is it? It's not. It's probably not possible that I would come up with something that has right. not been done before. Yeah, don't try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, do try. I'm kidding. That's literally the yeah. whole thing we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, little kid whose battery died right yeah. before I told him that was a joke. <laughs> Jeremy is so wise. He told me to stop trying. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> this one might be a little easier to kind of rapid fire. Yeah. yeah. So what are the what are the tools for your job? Hardware, software. Jeremy, kind of in the vein of your playlist, but maybe it's 
uh, maybe a certain device you work on, certain software you work in, a certain instrument, a certain camera. Uh, what are the tools of your or physical tools, software tools of your job? Anything that for me, it's anything that allows immediate delivery. So for me, I have my my backpack here. It's got my iPhone XS Max. I've got a case on it with a bunch of lens options. I've got all the apps in there, and I deliver everything the moment I shoot it. So I've been doing that for five, eight years or whatever, because in the mental cleanliness area, the the completion to the delivery, I get no payoff from. I mean, the the, the pushing to the giving it to the client is the excitement, and then after that, everything goes away. I don't care anymore. Mm. So having two weeks before you deliver your product is to me is just I, ludicrous friend of the show and so so yeah so for me I, I have a bag with a tripod and a stabilizer and whatever they're all very small very compact and it's just like how do I do that and then a dictionary is what I like as well for Ooh. the clarity stuff dictionary yeah that's good I like to uh, put the loss to rise about it <laughs> so don't be intimidated what do you use man you said iPad earlier yeah the, the iPad Pro is a game changer oh, for artists um, it's unbelievable I'm not going to get into it. There's a huge debate in the artist community of, of digital and traditional. I'm not going to go there. I think both have value and both serve a purpose. There's nothing like getting out oil paints and, and, sure. and brushes and a canvas. And, and there's, Once you're retired, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's nothing like that. There's nothing like a good mechanical pencil and micron pens. And there's, yep. that's all fun. But man, the iPad Pro with a, the Apple Pencil and the Adobe Suite. Unbelievable. I, I mean. You also, I think you mentioned Procreate. Yeah, Procreate's a. What is that, 10 bucks? It's, it's like, 10 bucks. It's unbelievable. It's 10 bucks and it rivals Photoshop, man. It's like. Sorry. Friend of the show. Procreate for 10 bucks. It's Photoshop yeah. on the go, which Adobe is releasing a full version of Photoshop on the iPad. It's going to be. So yeah. it's not like a light version of Photoshop. It's going to be Photoshop on the iPad. So that's still coming, I believe. But man, Procreate is a is a great tool. So I, I desire to be more minimalist in my tool set. Um, I, my wife would argue that because of how much stuff is in my studio and in my basement, paints and supplies and different pens and markers and stuff. So but man, to get to the point where you're literally just got an iPad with an Apple Pencil and a backpack and yeah. a, a coffee is... Uh, I, I also want to mention, you do a lot of the the art of books. Yeah. So the art of Star Wars, the art of whatever, mm -hmm. as like reference tools, right? Yeah. Um, I, like, I just like seeing the creative process. I like seeing how a studio took all these concept uh, drawings of Nemo and why did you decide that that was the one that you were going to go with for the look yeah. and feel of the movie? That's neat. Um, I've always, I wanted to be a character designer. I wanted somebody to say, okay, we've got this clownfish. He's probably four to six years old. Go. And then I just sit in a room and draw clownfish all day until somebody goes, that's the one. And then I give it to a, an, a 3D guy who builds it in 3D space. That's wild. To, to, to create something from nothing and mm. see why they made those decisions and why they thought that that would be more palatable for the audience. And why did you choose? There's a, a great um, visual uh, that's the, the color progression of every Disney movie. So Is it the palette? It's the palette throughout the course of the movie. So, um, like how will colors change? Like if you think of the beginning of Lord of the Rings, for example, the very first one, uh, when they're in the Shire and Frodo has not started the adventure yet, that is just so warm, lush green yeah. and just versus huh. when he's putting the ring in, you know, oh, yeah. spoiler alert, when he's putting the ring in the lava at, at Mordor. Oh my gosh. I mean the darks Mount and Doom. the orange, Mount Doom, sorry. Mount Doom. Um, but you can look at every single Disney movie over time and see the colors throughout the film on a little spectrum. And almost every movie, three-fourths of the way through, when the hero is facing his challenge, back to the story brand, the colors are dark and they're menace, they're ominous, mm -hmm. and they're um, versus when everything started out happy, <laughs> it was bright and color. So yeah. what color choices were made and for what reason? One of the things I saw when I was at DreamWorks, they were working on a movie that, that ended up not coming out called The Larrikins, which was going to be a story about all these characters in the bush in um, Australia. And one of the main themes of the movie was confidence. And they were showing, they were mapping the confidence of every major character with push pins and yarn on a wall. And then they were saying, if the confidence of the character changes in the movie, how will their posture change? 
how will their, the colors of the wow. movie change based on... So things like that, and that's why I love those art of books. It's like all that thinking, yeah. hundreds and thousands of people telling one 90-minute story. That stuff is fascinating to how me. How do you get so. that many people like on... In sync. In sync, like yeah. with all of those details. It's amazing. It's uh, it, they're, the... the the stuff that they have in the shared spaces to make sure that those folks are all aligned with the story yeah. is um, if you've never read the book Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull, he's the president of uh, Pixar and Disney uh, Animation Studios or was. I think there were some issues with like salary capping. and hmm. uh, Anyway, uh, Creativity Inc. is a great book that kind of goes into that a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, that's a whole art in and of itself. You had mentioned uh, you had mentioned about like oh there's some question of qualification if you're using the old styles or the new styles. Mm. That's true in every art form. Sure. When you were doing glass plate for, or you know plate photography, they're like you're not a real photographer unless you're using this three thousand pound machine. Mm. And then it comes to film, and those guys were trash. Those are just. And then it comes to faster film, instant film, and all those things. And then it comes to digital. And every group said the next group is not real photographers. And so now it's like you know oh you're not using a DSLR. You're using a mirrorless camera. Well, you know, and it just continues to move. And that's why I made that joke in episode eight about basketball. It was a joke, but I said, you know, Michael Jordan plays basketball and so do I. That's that's how art is. Like if you draw, you're an artist. Yeah. But there are levels of skill and higher ability and those sort of things. But who cares to me? Who cares what medium? This is a huge discussion. It is. Who cares what medium if you own it and you go for it? Like real art is the outcome of, of the of this. And the same is true for music. Music, yeah. <laughs> Kendall, Music's art. What are your tools? Oh, sorry, Dylan. Hey, uh, it's all good. No, no, I'm <laughs> I'm here for the discussion, but I'm trying to keep it, you know, pointed. So uh, I've and I, I had a minor epiphany about halfway through this episode. Um, Did it hurt? No. <laughs> well, and actually, if you want, so right now in my head, I'm trying to think of is minor epiphany grammatically correct, and I don't think it is because it's epiphany. <laughs> we can I look it up later. It's sort of an extremist word, and therefore to From qualify the it would be, would be inappropriate. Irregardless, continue. <laughs> Irregardless. <laughs> Irregardlessly. That's be, it's kind of like saying something is kind of unique, right? Which is something I've ranted about before. <laughs> yeah. You can't be kind of unique. You can't be very unique. You're unique or you're not. Like, you cannot qualify the word unique, and to try to do so is grammatically I'm incorrect. I'm going to take a couple phrases out of the next question. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. I just got to scratch. Be a careful off with there. those. The wording well, that, of your question that shortened enough. the episode up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, no. So that that for me, as I'm sitting here, like listening to you guys and and trying my best to try to relate with your experiences, is that the, very specifically for me, like the closest thing to it is just the songwriting process and not like the other stuff. Uh, so that's how I'm approaching it now for the next few minutes. So songwriting. The uh, uh, acoustic guitar, um, some kind of a piano or keyboard, anything that has keys on it that I can just plunk on and hear a note. Yeah. And uh, paper and a pen. Cool. It's, that's, and quiet. That's all. And, and, and quiet. And quiet. I've never, used, um, I've never used any kind of technology. Uh, other than those, those in your three life. things so for, for 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 the purposes of songwriting, I've never like uh, I've never like recorded as I went uh, or anything like that. I've never I've never sort of like put something together on GarageBand first and then learned how to play it. Um, that kind of thing, which is popular, and, and that's and that 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 speaks to the like you have all these GarageBand musicians, SoundCloud, yeah, yeah, let's go, and. Uh, and and so like all of the old school musicians are now are br now bringing that up. These guys aren't, they can't pick up an instrument and play it. What yeah. do they do in front of live people? I don't know, blah blah blah. And it's like, well, I mean, it's there are there is a specific skill set that that is unique to the uh, the live musician who who has an instrument in, in their hand and they're playing with other musicians. Um, there's a, there is, it is true. There's a skill set there that the SoundCloud musician does not have, or at least is not practicing. You can argue the merit but, of the groups, but not that it's, a, that it's a form but, of art. Yeah. yeah. But they're still being creative. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they, and, and they can still create something good. Um, so, so I'm not, I'm not arguing against doing it any other way. Just saying that's, 
that's how I've yeah. always done it has been very like that simple. And then as far as like hearing any other parts, um, like for the, for the keyboardist or for the drummer or, or, or cello players or banjo players that I've played with. And, uh, I've often typically, and this is where, so this is where worship leading has actually, uh, lent itself to, um, to some things that are a little bit easier than, than other formats. And that like with worship leading, I've been worshiping with like the same core group of people, uh, for a very long time. And so the same basic group of musicians, uh, and, and there's been, there's been some turnaround, but it doesn't change fast enough that I don't get used to sort of like the new musician, um, before the next one goes away. And so what that means is like, I can be, I'm thinking in my head as I'm writing a song that like, I, I know how our keyboardist tends to play. I know how our drummer tends to play. And I already know those things, and I have them in my mind when I'm writing. That's and, really interesting. And, and, is, and we've yeah. played together often enough and for a long enough period of time that, like, these days I introduce a new song, and, like, expectations are met within, like, it the just first, rolls right out within the first several times That's that we've wild. played it. Yeah. Um, That's now, really if cool. I have something like super specific that I want to make sure that we're doing like like rock hits here or a cut here or or whatever or um, or I'll like sing out a part for for the keyboardist or or whatever else like there, there's that kind of thing still happens some, but uh, no. But for the most part, like I'm I'm almost writing to a certain expectation that I that I I I know kind of basically what they sound like and what they like to do, uh, and it it works. Cool. So it's much more difficult to do that in a, in what I think like another in a different type of band setting that doesn't have that cohesion, doesn't have those years behind them. In my experience, where it's like you're you're writing a song and then you're you're teaching the parts on yeah. every song. And yeah, Dylan, anyway. you say you're not creative, but your questions have brought out such insightful, random conversations, and so that's a creative skill in and of itself. You're like, what's your favorite ice cream? And we're like, what is ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey man, we're all creative. Everybody. You're welcome. Everybody is Dylan's in the club. Creative. It yeah. just it just All right. Well, you guys you guys have been great. I'm going to ask a few more kind of quick um because uh I have some more questions I want answered, but feel free to keep going. So, uh what's your best idea that never came to fruition? These are kind of rapid fire. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, but I'm going to kind of ask him that way cuz Yeah. There's been so much good stuff, but I had a I had kind of an existential project that I was working on where I was noticing this flash of like emotional just boom that people had. I would notice it across the room. Someone would be very interested in someone else and they would send this weird like signal with how they looked. People would have deep sadness and all these things. So I had a project that I was working on where I sat down with some folks, including some family of mine, my, actually my grandmother and some others. And I ended up shutting the project down because it felt forced. But basically what I was doing was I was sitting in front of them and I was asking them to think for about 20 or 30 seconds about the most emotional moment of their life. And I said, please don't tell me what it is and just think about it. When you hit the point where, where you feel deepest in that moment, please open your eyes. I'm going to take a photograph, but I'm not going to ask for any context. You're not going to be working through this moment. It can be positive. It can be negative. And so I, I did that and I got these really incredible photographs. And what I was going to do was have them rate, uh, choose a color, on a scale of how they felt uh, based on, on that emotion and then a number of the intensity. And then I was going to take the colors and the numbers and create like a sound wave, line up the colors and the numbers by height and by color. Mm -hmm. And then I was going to do a book of, of just these faces um, with their, their line color rating with no context. Wow. Um, and I just thought that it would create some empathy and people would be able to see that and go, that's where I am right now. You know, like that's, that's my thing. I, I wish I that's knew more, cool. but that's my thing. And I got um, probably seven photographs in and scrapped the project because I felt I just couldn't, I couldn't get past the feeling that I was kind of preying on these people's deepest hmm. emotions. I thought it was an important project. I still feel like it could be something important, but I just thought just as a person, I felt like, man, like how can I not ask this person if they're okay? And, and how can I help? You know what I mean? But hmm. the, the integrity of the project would be not to ask anything. So I just felt uh, you know, disconnect and, and shut it down. That's kind of an interesting project. I don't know if it's a good one, but I can't. I can't think of one. I'm sure there are times when I thought something would land a little better that I that I tossed up and it kind of got shot down. 
Um, but none of them are, you know, top of mind. Mm-hmm. Kendall? A friend and I one time wanted, really wanted to try to start a, uh, a, a comedic tongue-in-cheek metal band. <laughs> and it just never fell. All right. It never dropped. Uh, how does your how does your immediate or closest family uh, respond to sort of your creative passions and and the things that you do and your processes things like that? They trust me, but don't get it. You know, I, I don't mean that as a dig to them. It's been enough times that I've come through that they go, yeah, he's going to nail this. He's going to be great. But I, I don't know that my family quite understands how and what I do. I realize now if they're listening to this, this might feel hurtful for me to say, I don't mean it that way. They're extremely supportive and uh, understand, but they, the process itself, it's almost like if I was talking to, you know, my dad and in his, the technical side of what he does, I would mm. go, I don't know, but yeah. I know he's a successful thing that he does. It's explaining your favorite video game to your grandpa. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? and it's not because they're behind. It's just because what I do is kind of neat. I'm just, I'm just glad you're having fun. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think these two episodes, episodes, why can't I? These two episodes would demystify it somewhat, but I do think that they go. I, I know he's going to do great, and they're fully supportive. But they're like, he goes off into this little zone and just churn, yeah, churns out, churns out things, and it's cool and it it looks great. But I don't know how or why or like. Yeah. But I think trying to parse it out and explain each chunk in these last two episodes, that <laughs> they might be enlightening for. I'd like Perfect. to hear their take on after these episodes and say, what do you think that I do? So let's yeah. see if it's any better at all. Let's hear your take in the comments section of all of our social media pages. Yeah. What about you, Kendall? Uh, I would say something similar to Jeremy's answer. My, my, my parents were very traditional and, uh, um, just if, I mean, if there were guitars and drums involved, it was, it was communists. Um, so that was, um, got it. <laughs> yeah. That's yep. saying a lot, uh, since they would have been old enough to live through the cold war era. <laughs> so yeah, that, legitimately I mean, saw yeah, that. Yeah. They've that's, come that's around, they've label. come around, they've come around since, yeah. since like the, the, the earlier moments there. But, uh, no. So, so I, I would say that they very much don't get it, but they're, yeah. uh, but they're glad that I'm doing something, I suppose. And then like, I've got. I've got a sister who's really close to me in age who's like who's like all about everything like that that I've ever tried. Who's been super supportive and a fan of it. Um and another sister who's who's quite a bit older than I, um, who's also very, very supportive. If everybody got it, we wouldn't get paid. So yeah. I mean we're kind of our job is to be out on the edge a little bit That's away right. from everyone. So who stretches you guys creatively? Oh. You can rattle them off, it's fine. Uh, my dad, if I'm a kite, my dad is the, the string for the kite. You know, he's not mm. restrictive, but he's always kind of holding me, tethering me down. So I think he and I, you know, we'll butt heads from time to time, but he's been a, a really supportive um, kind of stretch. Because I'm, I'm, when I think of stretch, it's funny. It's the opposite, Dylan. Like, it, it's not outward. It's kind of inward. It's almost like gathering all this wild and crazy stuff. So m- me building character and restrictions has been the biggest thing. So people who help me develop my life and my character uh, have been probably the ones that have helped me be most creative, I would say. Um, I mentioned uh, in seven, I think that I have a whole feed of uh, just my favorite artists um, in an Instagram feed. And so being inspired, not immobilized by people who are far beyond me um, is whether that's a creative writer like Donald Miller with this book, building a story brand, or whether that's artists that I look up to, and I don't even want to start naming them because I'm going to leave some of my favorites out and then right. overthink that later. Um, but but I, I think it's so important to just immerse yourself in that as much as possible. Even as creatives, we have there's a danger of getting in a rut mm-hmm. of this is the way I do it with every client. This is the process I go through. It typically ends up going here. If you're not listening to <laughs> listening to podcasts, watching a TED Talk, reading a book, looking at art, being inspired by art, seeing what's out there, There's a great Will Rogers quote that says, even if you're on the right track, if you just stand still, you'll get run over. And so as a creative, that's that's uh, that's a poke in the ribs, because um, I think you need to keep reinventing yourself, seeing what's going on, seeing what's landing with people, seeing the type of art that's speaking to people and just make sure that you're filling yourself with that, because whatever you put in is going to come out. So I think you'll just get better by osmosis in some ways. I bet you're in people's feed, though. 
I, I, get, I bet you somebody that your feed is, you're in their feed. That would be nice to it. I to, bet. That would be nice. Kendall? Um, Tom DeLonge. Who, who, who uh, stretches <laughs> you, who stretches you creatively yeah. was Dylan's question. Right. A good one. I, indeed. Um, yeah, I would say that the same thing. Other, other artists and, uh, more specifically, I think I like, I like to try to think of, of, uh, cause I, I, I'm a very eclectic music fan and, uh, so I often try to pull and borrow from from different styles of music and, and, and interject them into into something that I'm doing that has nothing to do with metal or whatever. So we actually have one worship song that has like a very metal sounding kind of lick to it. If you were to add distortion on the guitars, it would sound like a metal song. Sick. Um, but uh, so. So, yeah, so kind of. Yeah, no, not kind of that. That. OK. Yeah. All right. Uh, so if you had to give. Uh, If you had to give some advice to somebody and you only got time for a one liner, uh, somebody that wants to get into what you're doing, what's your quick, what's your quick tip for somebody who's like, Hey, how do I get into what you're doing? Uh, Ask questions. Don't try to prove yourself yet. Just, just, just soak it in. Yeah. Get around people who are where you want to be. Journal thoughts and ideas. That's good. good. And uh, can anybody share anything about their next big project or the next big thing they're working on? Anything that you want to share? Something that's yet to be revealed? Yeah, I, I've never said it out loud to a group, but you've, you've heard it here. Um, I've talked to Dylan. has been an advisor to me, and, and I hope to have him be part of the project. I think I, over the last year and a half, have been able to develop a, a process to help uh, fix the blue-collar economy problem in the United States. So I'm going to be working on that yeah, over the next six months. Little side thing. Speaking of being a jerk for going first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's that's uh, just the economy. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix the What are you world. working on, Nuss? Sketch guy? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you doodling? Hey, <laughs> we're going to need a doodler. <laughs> K- Kendall, you're up. You're up. Doodler, get in here and doodle for me. Doodle, professional doodler boy. Give yeah. me a swoop in that procreate. One of the terms for graphic facilitator is scribe. Yeah. <laughs> and that just feels like such a scribe, get in here. I want something doodled. Draw me a swoop. I need a swoop. Post haste. Post haste. <laughs> Sorry. Give me adjectives. <laughs> You doodle, don't you? <laughs> All right. Well, Kendall's dead on the floor. Corey, do you have any big projects upcoming you want to share? Or no. Nothing you can think of? No. All right, cool. Kendall? <laughs> Shut down, sucker. <laughs> Payback. Well, I'm the host, and uh, part of that uh, job is time management. So here go. I am. All right. So I, I actually said at the beginning of episode, I think, nine, uh, I was going to see if you guys had any questions for one another. I think you did that really well. Yeah. But I certainly don't want to keep you from asking questions if anyone has anything big. So let the creatives point their questions better than the host. I have a real I have a question, but I'm afraid it's too big and we're already over an hour. Do you think it would be a problematic? Do it. Just if, do it. So uh, we'll cut it if we need to. We won't, though. One of the things that's being said about social media, think the days of Vine and YouTube, is that it's just creating this, let's look at just the, uh, the area of comedy. It's creating this giant cesspool of mediocrity. The comedians Correct. aren't worried because they're like, the, the cream will rise to the top like it always does. So that's, that's the pat answer for what I'm going to ask you, Jeremy. It seems like there was a movement in photography. I'm just going to pick a number 10 years ago where every stay-at-home mom picked up a camera. Momtographers, we called it. Picked up, (laughs) momtographers, Mm -hmm. picked up a camera and they said, oh, I'm a photographer now. And somebody did a little watermark that they slapped on every photo that they took. And there was this huge insurgence of Mm -hmm. um, momtographers. I say all that when one of my dearest friends is a phenomenal Yeah person who was working in uh, corporate America, didn't love her job, became a photographer, and is now featured in Bride magazine yeah. traveling the world. So it was a very so, lucrative period for people selling instructional DVDs. <laughs> I knew those people. It's for real. That so so, so she, has, she is, and I've seen her work and her husband's work. They are some of the most talented photographers I've seen. Sure. So the cream does rise to the top. But how did that make those that studied it as an art form and went to college for it and were in green rooms pr- doing yeah. film the old fashioned way and have a love and a passion? How did that make you feel when there was this huge influx? Yeah, I was in the middle these, of that. Yeah. Uh, of all these stay at home moms who and here's the thing. 
the masses can't really tell a difference in the quality for the most part. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's... because somebody who's good at drawing, somebody who isn't good at drawing can't fake it. Yeah. But somebody who can pick up a camera with a uh, with a point and shoot camera, for the most part, it's harder to discern skill there. So how did that make you feel being in that wave? And do you think that that slowed down? And just would, just speak would to you, some would of that. The, would the question be, uh, how did it hit me? And then what is my interpretation of that period of time? Yeah, if you were going to summarize that time and if you were going to talk about yeah. what it was like to be... In, in that world, yeah, then. yeah. And, well, and, 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 has anybody been able to point to what happened? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a commodity through technology is what happened. So what happened was, um, first of all, I am, I am one hundred percent pro momtographer, um, but I'll just put that out there. But um, what happens is, uh, the qualification for an art form is access to the tools initially. So if you're, if you're a photographer, the qualification for photography is, a, is a, is a camera. <laughs> Right. You know, and there's no real restriction of access to expertise. And the minimum requirement for photography is a properly ish exposed, properly ish composed photo. And that is a photograph and that memory is valuable. Uh, and so what happens is gear is expensive. People grind really hard to make money to buy the gear and then the gear price goes down. So iPad Pros right now, it's about your talent. It's about how you express yourself. It's no longer about that's why that's why there's great a great lack of diversity in certain sports because it's just access to the tools. If you live in an inner city situation or you live in a rural situation where you have no access to resources, you can't play those sports that require massive amounts of entry. And and that's what happened. The camera market got commoditized. And I think that was good because what ends up happening is, um, you know, what I said was welcome to the party. We're so glad you're here. Okay. Now there's a service that's needed. Uh, things like janitorial work have a service. There's not a creative need in janitorial work except for at the executive level of how you arrange the business. If you can clean the trash cans and do a good job, photography became that at its minimum level. Can you point at something, properly expose it, decently compose it, and take the photograph? There's already emotional value built into the photo right. because of the client's need to, to be loved. <laughs> So, so it was a, it was a neat time. So that's now what we had is we had a lot of second graders, for example, in the industry. And then we had this influx of instructors that were third graders. And so we had a ton of third graders teaching second graders. That was my frustration is not with the montographers. I was very, very glad that they had a way to get out and express themselves and provide and you know, we talk about Proverbs 31 wives in our home that they're, they're uh, just free and flourishing and, and, and loving what they do. I love that. What happened, though, was there was just this huge uh, Grant Cardone's DVD sale type culture of training them tips and tricks. And very few of them focused on clarity of like, what am I doing? Why does this matter? Uh, so for me, I'm not at risk uh, if I reentered the market. I'm not at all at risk of those market trends because what ends up happening is... Uh, is what I'm doing is very clear and very pointed. Mm -hmm. And so when someone would have to come specifically to my space and outdo me there and nobody's talking like that. And there's hundreds and hundreds of people in the same way that are expressing themselves clearly. So yeah, I thought it was fantastic. And you'll see this in every single industry. This happened with SoundCloud. You know, people are buying Macs, people are buying Asus computers and putting whatever yeah. fruity loops on it. And, mm -hmm. and now the, what matters is how is the art? How are you doing? And these guys are incredible. These SoundCloud artists are incredible. They've recreated the entire sound. Mm -hmm. And so photography is that way. I'm bored with it. I mean, everybody uses the same filters. Everybody shoots the same way. Sure. They overexpose the baby's face. I get that, but I can teach that. That's right. all right. So I'm, I'm very pro momtographer. Um, I'm working with a lot of young photographers. I'm working with probably three or four, including one of my kids uh, at our church and helping them start their photography business at 11, 12, 15. My daughter wants to be a missionary nurse. I said, you can take your camera literally anywhere, go make your money like you do with your pen. Yeah. I think it's incredible. I think it's amazing. I think we'll start fusing different crafts and art forms. I'm, I'm doing storytelling and clarity and photography. Someone else might be doing engineering and design and photography. I mean, I think it's going to start turning into something special. And it would create, it would, it would meet the need, like I said about logos, there are levels. Yeah. So, so, so that's fine. You can have... The commodity work should be cheap. That's just the reality of it. You don't want to be doing that work anyway. Right. 
That's what I mean. That's I'm super guessing. interesting. I had one of my one of my well, we had him on. Greg was a photographer while all the, all that was going on, and I was like, dude, how does that making you feel? Like, are they undercutting you as in prices? Because what oh, it sh- yeah. what it should cost to shoot a wedding versus what they were charging? Oh, yeah. You're like, thanks sure. a lot, man. I'll never get another wedding again. <laughs> but you got to get. I'm not trying to be coy here. You got to get out of the middle in terms of your industry. So you you have to be one of those people that gets it and can command any price at a dinner table. Or you start and you earn your licks, you know, and you do it for 300 bucks. The people that got killed were doing it for $1,200. Sure. They were the ones that were doing what the $300 people were doing for 12 because there was a lack of supply. Yeah. So that group got murdered. I mean, they were just, it was devastating. Uh, and a lot of them went, no, I'm, I'm 8,000. I'm joining that group. Yeah. And they got help and they worked it through. So the Man, middle, the middle really... of the industry just disappeared, I guess would be the economic impact of, <laughs> of that. And I stinking love it. I hate when people qualify whether or not you are something like, let's look at quality if we want to do that. But I hate it. I hate when you say you're not a real basketball player. My dude over there is dribbling a basketball and shooting it. That dude's a basketball player. Right. Relax. Right. So anyway, that's a, that's, that's a, really well articulated. A I really like how you, 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 you painted that picture and I'm seeing the same, like you said, in the music space right now, almost every, uh, later teenage boy that I know is making beats. Mm-hmm. I've never heard I've never Good. heard more people say I'm making beats. Good. Yeah, and I'm I just I absolutely. So so I can't talk like I did in 7 and not support the the influx in any industry. I'm just wondering what ripple effect does that have? How does that shake out in terms of of the cream rising to the top and and pricing and what that it's just an interesting conversation. There's a there's a little wrestling match going on over here where anybody can get together and spar and do whatever and then there's a ring in there where it's yeah. like real deal and and if you want to compete in the ring you have to go actually compete in the ring and you have That's to be awesome. great and excellent. But I love seeing momtographers and young illustrators and beat makers wrestling on the side and sparring with each other and they're they're doing a bunch of nonsense. They're stealing work, they're plagiarizing, they're goofing off. They're doing the stuff we did. Absolutely. When we started, we were tracing things and we were literally just ripping off people saying, well, I changed the corner there a little bit. Well, it's, you know? the, it's the Fiverr for logo design. That's right. Yeah. You can go spend $10 on a logo for your business. I'm not trying to compete in yep. that space. I say good. <laughs> good for you. I say good because over there they figured out a business model where people without opportunity are cranking out these basic logos and they're making a real living. Yeah. Uh, but how are you going to? It sounds like you're already there. You know, I mean, it's it's a really it's a really neat. It's really neat, um, destructive progression, Ooh. you know, kind of a forest fire sort of thing. Hmm. I think we're good. We're, we're, we're pretty well over our normal, uh, uh, time, but this has been such rich conversation. Um, so grateful guys. Thank you for having me oh on. This gosh. has been, uh, I, I listen in the car typically on my commute and, uh, I've caught myself taking some extra laps, some extra laps around <laughs> the building to finish. I'm, I'm dead serious. I've really enjoyed it and it's been kind of a kind of a huge boost for me to to be here with you so thank you it's been really really good otherwise you wouldn't have come back for another episode so yeah. um really appreciate your time and again sorry we don't have a t-shirt or something to give you you um, will i talked about it <laughs> sounds good anything else anybody want to say before we sign off or, or knock off of the table jeepers creepers Okay, this has been fun. Thank you guys for listening. Please, um, as we've said each episode, we are all over the interwebs, and we really want to make this interactive. So if you could, um, we have links in our profiles to do a couple things. Um, one is the hashtag thoughts from the middle, or you can email us directly at from the middle at protonmail.com. Ask us a question, something you want us to talk about, a certain type of guest you want us to have on the show. Um, that would be awesome. And uh, also, there's a capability for you to actually leave a voicemail, and we can use that audio clip in an episode. So if you want to do that, that would be fun as well. Jeremy, hey, has I just want to say uh, I'm off of, uh, you guys know I'm kind of off the grid. I do have an Instagram account uh, that I don't want you to follow me on, relax. Uh, but here's what I'm going to do. If you guys follow, what's your what's some of your stuff? You just said all of it? At from the mid here's, here's what I want you to do. If you go to one of my posts and you and you do at 
from the mid pod. Mm -hmm. Just put it on any one of my posts. I'm going to do a contest where I randomly draw from those folks and I'm going to give you one of the HH Boogie uh, Unbound albums. They're usually like wow. very expensive. So um, so I'm going to give you one of those. Go to one of my posts, family included, anybody, but I want you to go to my post and type in at from the middle and then I want you to go follow them on at least one of the platforms and make a comment and I'm going to give away uh, one of the HH Boogie. No minimum participation required. So if you're the only one, you're going to get that. So make sure you jump Jump on there at Jeremy Aaron Kester is my is my Instagram at J E R E M Y K E R A A R O N K E S T E R at Jeremy Aaron Kester uh, and then and then put at from the mid pod yeah and uh, we're gonna give away one of those things so please we're gonna get this thing started I'm a huge fan <laughs> let's go guys this is ready that's awesome this what is a, ready what a class that act. was we did not know that was coming Thanks, very Jeremy. cool man. me neither you're the best um, one more little disclaimer so um, some of you have asked there's actually another Corey Hubble illustrator who spells his name k-o-r-y and spells uh, his last name the same as me he worked on the video game Halo um, he is a more of like a concept artist and does so just want to set the record straight <laughs> that that there is another Corey Hubble illustrator. I met him actually trying to get the domain name CoreyHubble.com and he already had it. And we discovered that like we're like a year apart and spell our names exactly the same and he's yeah. an illustrator. So kind of crazy. But um, if you see more concepty, concept arty kind of halo stuff, there's another Corey Hubble whose work is incredible. But anyway, just wanted to set the record straight on that. So thanks, guys. Good stuff. <laughs> Peace. Luke, Chris. Awesome. Out.